that. I've, I've been a single dad for four days. My wife has been watching the NCAAs. I've been home. Is there something wrong with that picture? Okay. So here's what's going on. We, we just finished a, a, a series in the Gospel of John for like 20 weeks, so way to go. Uh, Jason Soderstrom, our lead pastor, will be back next week on Easter. We'll be in John 21 if you're going to read ahead. We're starting a new series of messages next week. Tyler, restore me. We're going to unpack what it means to be Restoration Church for several weeks. So yeah, that's to look forward to. Um, but today, we're kind of in this in-between series thing, and I get to talk about whatever I want to talk about. And I have no accountability because Jason and Billy are gone. I'm, I'm the JV if you're new to Restoration. So here's what I want to talk about. I'm, I want to talk about how to interpret the weirdest book in the Bible without becoming weird yourself. Okay? So I, you may have heard about this. A survey was done where people were asked, what percentage of our population is weird? And people said about 50%. That was the average. So look at the person on your left and then on your right. And it's either them or you. Okay? So I'm going to help you not become even more weird if you are weird, uh, which I am, by learning how to interpret a really weird book in a, in a way I think is more accurate. So, um, and then, then I want to talk about, after talking about that weird book, I want to talk about Team Lamb and Team Dragon. That's my favorite part of this message. And then, then I want to talk about weddings and Easter, because why not? And if, if none of these dots connect, I'm hoping that all those dots connect in about 30 minutes. So, so bear with me, okay? But, but let me tell you what I want for you and what I've been praying for you this week. First of all, I, I want you to understand that you are in a cosmic spiritual battle between good and evil. I, I want to raise your awareness regarding this. Um, the real battles we face are not ultimately, according to Scripture, against flesh and blood or this group and that group, carnivores versus vegans, left versus right, CrossFit versus bodybuilders, whatever, okay, those are not the real battles. The real battle is a cosmic battle that's been going on since time began, okay, between good and evil. And it's very, very spiritual. And I, wanna, I, I want you to know that if you follow Jesus, also known as the Lamb, okay, we'll be talking about the Lamb today, that you're on the winning side even though it often looks like you're losing. And then finally, I, I want to potentially 10x your joy on Easter Sunday by encouraging you to invite everybody you know to our Easter services. All that and free coffee outside after the service. What a, what a time to be alive, right? Yeah? Okay. Easter next week. Okay. Um, l- let's start with this. How to interpret the weirdest book in the Bible without becoming weird yourself. What, what book am I talking about? Revelation. Very good. Very good. There's some weird books in the Bible. That's, that's the weirdest. So if you're new, I grew up irreligious, had not even touched the Bible until I was like 19 or 20 or so, and ran, read through the, the New Testament because they told me I should. And I got to Revelation, and I, I go, I need like a mushroom or a, some kind of hallucinogenic or something to be able to interpret this, this piece of literature because obviously the person who wrote it was on, on something. And, uh, and, and so over the years, you know, I've, I've read different interpretations, and I've, I've fallen in love recently. I've fallen in love with Revelation. I've been reading it differently. I've been reading commentaries, reading about the works of scholars, and I just, I've fallen in love with it. Um, Revelation is the last book in the library of books we call the Bible. If you're new to faith, new to Christianity, it was written by the Apostle John, whose gospel we've been in the last 20 weeks or so. And it's a recording of a vision, or more accurately, an apocalypse. The word apocalypse, it means a revealing. It's a revealing of of what God wants us to know cosmically about history. Uh, it, It was a common genre of literature in the first century and before the first century among oppressed people groups where they could write about their hopes without being thrown in jail. It was written uh, around 90 AD, again, by John. He was in prison on the island of Patmos. And, and scholars say he, he borrowed at least 500 verses or, or images from the Hebrew scriptures, especially Daniel and Ezekiel and a lot from the Psalms. And it, it, it's been viewed and interpreted many different ways over the years. I'm going to just give you three ways that people have interpreted this this book and tried to understand it. Um, One way is the the preterist view. Um, Scholars, some scholars who hold this view, they believe that Revelation is just about the past. It's about seven churches that existed in the first century in modern-day Turkey, and it's about what they were facing at at that time, which would be true. It, It is about that. But the people who have this view think it's all about the past. It's not about the present or the future, which, hey, I'm not a big history buff, so hey, so what? Um, next view, 
the predictive you. This is the one that if you grew up in church, you're probably most familiar with. And as you can probably understand, it's, it's about predicting the future. Okay, what Jesus is talking about in this vision with, to John, all this stuff that's going to happen down the road, and it's like the Nostradamus view of, of Revelation, okay? Uh, and, and, and church history is full of anecdotes of people who read Revelation this way, and they have always had egg on their face. They predicted, like, when the end is going to come. A lot of them were saying, Y2K. You guys are too young to know about Y2K, right? Anyway, there was a lot of people saying, it's going to happen in year 2000, because apparently God loves round numbers. Um, there's been lots of predictions about who the Antichrist is. You know, in recent years, I've heard Pope Francis. I've heard Ronald Reagan. And again, they've always been wrong. But I'll tell you what, between me and you, I've figured out who the Antichrist is. They got it wrong. I've got it right, okay? The problem is they think it's a person. It's not a person. It's a group of people. And we call them telemarketers, okay? <laughs> Do you agree? Do I have an amen in the room anywhere? Okay, good, good, good. All right. Uh, uh, again, the predictive view leaves people with egg on their face all the time. Which brings us to the cosmic view. Um, those holding this view believe that Revelation is not just about a particular period in history, nor is it just about the future. It is about the cosmic battle between good and evil that has always existed. If you haven't guessed by now, this is my view. Um, I, I, I believe a faithful reading of Revelation requires us to have this view. I believe John wrote down his vision, not so we could read it like a history book or an almanac, but as a manual for how disciples of the Lamb of God are to follow him faithfully in the middle of a cosmic battle where we invite people to join us as we anticipate what John calls the wedding supper of the Lamb and the birth of a whole new era where every chapter is better than the one before it. Is that good news? And that's why we need to talk about Team Lamb and Team Dragon. Right. Revelation 5, 1 through 3. Uh, then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. So here's what's happening. Uh, scholars say the scroll represents... You know, the, the, the apocalypse, the revealing God wants to give humanity. And in heaven, nobody was worthy of opening the scroll and reading it. And John's very distraught about this. And so he, he says in verses 4 through 6, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So what's happening here? I told you it's a weird book. Okay. So what's happening is some elder, some spiritual leader figure in, in heaven gives John this good news. He says, hey, guess what? The Lion of Judah can open the scroll. And everyone in heaven's like, okay, it's going to finally happen. The Lion of Judah is going to open the scroll. A little background on the Lion of, of Judah. Uh, King David was a, a fierce you know, military leader. Uh, considered by most Israelites the greatest king in the history of, of Israel, very successful in every way possible. And in Revelation, Jesus is called the Lion of Judah because he came from the tribe of Judah and he came from the lineage of, of King David. And so everyone in heaven is thinking, the Lion of Judah is going to do this. He's going to open the scroll. Because Jesus, he's not just the little eight pound, six ounce Newborn infant, Jesus, so cuddly and soft in the ballad of Ricky Bobby. He's not just that meek and mild Jesus. Uh, Jesus is a warrior, fierce and brave. So we're celebrating Palm Sunday this, this week all over the world. Churches are remembering the last days of Jesus' life. And some people are going to read that text about the last night when he was betrayed. And then Peter cuts this soldier's ear off. And uh, Jesus says, no, no, no. He goes, Peter, don't you know, I could open up a can of you know what right now. And just evaporate all these guys. But Jesus did not return violence for violence. That, by the way, that was, my, that was my paraphrase. I don't think he said open up a can, but maybe. Um, the next day after he was betrayed, he sacrificed himself as the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. Which is why, you don't want to miss this, it's not the Lion of Judah who opened the scroll. Okay. Big change up coming. Here we go. Verses 6 through 9. Then I saw a Lamb 
not a lion, but a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, bloody lamb, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. So instead of the fierce lion of Judah taking the scroll and opening it, Jesus, the slain lamb of God, who purchased people from every tribe, language, people, and nation on the cross, took the scroll and opened it. And we never hear again in the book of Revelation about the Lion of Judah. But 30 more times we hear about the slain Lamb of God. Jesus the Lamb is the central theme of the book of Revelation. Jesus the Lamb is the central theme. If you want to understand Revelation, you have to read it in light of Jesus being the Lamb of God. And to interpret it, you have to realize that that Jesus is the Lamb and he's inviting other people to follow the Lamb and join Team Lamb. Which brings us to Team Dragon. Verses 7 through 9, and there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who's called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So in in John's vision, there's the lamb, but there's also the dragon. The dragon is Satan. And apparently at some point in time, Satan was cast out of heaven. And with him, other angels, later called demons. And so now there's team lamb, those who worship the lamb, and there's team dragon, Satan, uh, demonic powers, his evil minions, but also human beings. It says in Revelation 13, 4, people worshiped the dragon. People worshiped the dragon. The way God sees things is it's not like March Madness, okay, where you get lots of teams. There's just two teams. There's Team Lamb and there's Team Dragon. You're on one or the other, whether you know it or not. So if I'm honest with you, I don't think it's that cool to be on Team Lamb. I mean, my flesh does not go, yes, I'm on Team Lamb. I mean, you don't see sheep at CrossFit gyms. (laughs) You don't see sheep, you know, like in MMA fights. There's nothing cool about being a sheep. There's not like, you know, sheep don't go around thumping their chest going, hey, I'm like the lamb chop goat. You know, like it's just not cool to be a sheep. And it's, it's like ego diminishing and humbling to go, I'm on team lamb. <laughs> Join me. Right? Yeah. My, my ego wants to be on team dragon because dragons are cool. You know, dragons, can like, they can breathe and like evaporate people. You know? Dragons slay people. This is how I picture myself. This is me. That's, this is who I want to be, you know, not mutton busting. I want, to be on a, I want to be on a dragon with a sword and, you know, Gandalf without the beard and the hair and the wisdom. But, you know, I want to be that guy. Uh, the other day, I found myself back on Team Dragon. This is not a static thing. Even if you're on Team Lamb, we're tempted all the time to go back to Team Dragon. And so uh, my wife and I, we're, we're building a house. We're actually rebuilding a house. And um, we thought, how hard can it be? You know, we've never built a house, never done construction, don't know any trades. But wait, it can't be that hard. You got YouTube videos, you know, you got friends, stuff like that. Like, easy, they said it would be. So we go, let's just do this. Well, let me tell you, it is super hard to build a house, okay? If you're in the, in the industry, I have nothing but respect for you if you're in the construction industry. The hardest part is working with the, the contractors, I've discovered, and so we had a framer frame our house. And, uh, I mean, three floors, okay, and we had to tear it all out. Our wall, walls were like, mm, like that. And um, Kenny was there, our facilities manager. You keep this between us when I said to that guy. But I went on Team Dragon, and I, like, dragon breathed all over that guy. That's between me and you, okay? So that cost me at least $10,000. And, um, and then we hired a plumber that a friend of mine recommended. 
And, and we really embraced this guy, okay? We started praying with this guy. We had his family over for dinner. I shared the gospel with this guy. My wife, who's a real estate agent, helped him with a lease agreement. He was getting hosed and didn't know it. I told him, I go, hey, you do us a solid, and you do a great job for us, and uh, we know a few people. I bet we can, like, really help you get a lot of work, you know? So we, we poured ourselves into this guy. Well, uh, we, we failed to pass our plumbing inspection a few weeks ago. And then I found out later he lied to us about being licensed and insured. And the total cost of the damages done to us were north of $30,000. We had to tear out all the plumbing. Oh, oh, and then we had to tear up the new freshly poured cement with the pipes underneath it that were leaking, that didn't pass the pressurized test. Tore up the cement, started all over. Okay. So <laughs> I jumped on my dragon. I go, screw Team Lamb. No more mutton busting. I jumped on my dragon. So here I am again. Okay, remember this, okay? Jumped on the dragon, grabbed my sword, found myself a dragon attorney, okay? Left this guy a dragon voicemail, promising to sue him. Because uh, that's what you do when you're on Team Dragon. That's a, that's a dragon weapon. I feel like for about uh, 15 minutes, I feel like Russell Crowe, when he was about to unleash hell, you know, like in Gladiator, and it felt awesome for like 15 minutes. I felt so powerful and so strong. It felt great. And then the Holy Spirit <clears throat> ruined my little dragon party. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit says, why don't you read this Sermon on the Mount? Let me tell you, if you're on Team Dragon, that is a major dragon buzzkill, okay? So I, I read that part about uh, turning the other cheek. And then I read the part about if, if someone takes your shirt, then give them your coat. And, and then I read the part about loving your enemies and praying for them and blessing them. And then the, the part I really don't like about being, being perfect like your heavenly father is, is perfect. And I, the Holy Spirit said, put your sword down. And I did. Right before I had a chance to cut my plumber's financial ear off like Peter in the, in the garden, right? And I, I wrote him a letter. And I have a witness, my assistant goes to church here. She mailed it for me because I didn't have the courage to do so. But in that letter, I told him everything he did wrong. And I detailed the cost. And uh, I told him I wouldn't mind if you paid me back, which I don't expect he will. But I told him that uh, I forgive him. And um, I'm not going to sue him and take him to court. You see, the dragon wanted to form me into his image by tempting me to use dragon weapons to get my pound of flesh out of this guy. And then Jesus stopped me, and he gave me an opportunity to re-enlist with Team Lamb and become like Team Lamb by using lamb weapons, not dragon weapons. And by God's grace, I did. So let me ask you a question. What's the primary weapon of Team Lamb? Anybody know? Love, grace, the gospel, mercy. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's giving others what God has given us that we didn't deserve. It's forgiveness. It's canceling debts. It, it's sacrifice. Uh, the lamb does not use violence to win battles. Uh, nor does the lamb cancel people or launch propaganda campaigns against them or sue them to holy hell like I was about to do. The lamb wins by loving. And loving often looks a whole lot like losing when you're on Team Dragon. When Jesus was on the cross, it, it looked like he lost. And, and Team Dragon thought they'd won a decisive victory. They were like, this was way too easy. And after they watched Jesus die and breathe his last breath on that cross, they were like, they were like this. Like, Done. KO. And they broke out the champagne and they started playing, you know, We Are the Champions by Queen through a huge party. But here's what happened next. Three days later... He rose from the dead, proving that, in fact, he was the one who won. But he used lamb weapons, not dragon weapons. 
And next week we get to celebrate that. Amen? Yeah. Um, the lamb had taken away the sins of the world. Um, the lamb defeated sin and death by dying in our place on the cross and then rising from the dead, revealing that the lamb alone had the keys to life and to death. And now Satan and his team, um, they know they're defeated. It's just a matter of time until the lamb returns as king of kings and lord of lords and wraps up this age and begins the age that is to come. An age when there is no dragon. Is that worth clapping over? Yeah, come on. So Team Lamb wins by loving, which looks like losing if you're on Team Dragon. So I lost $30,000 at least to my plumber. Okay? And it hurts. Yeah. But if he comes to faith, and even if he doesn't, my reward in heaven will be so much greater. It'll make $30,000 look like pocket lint. Amen? Yeah. Team Lamb listens more than it talks. Team Lamb gives away more than it saves. Team Lamb builds bridges where others build barriers. Team Lamb uses words, not weapons. So in, in Revelation 19, Jesus comes back and he's on his white steed and he's got a sword. But the sword's not in his hand like me and the dragon. The sword comes out of his mouth. He doesn't bring everyone to justice and set things aright by killing people with a, with a sword, but by the words of his mouth, he will bring about final and ultimate justice. And we're to follow his ways. Now, a little caveat here uh, for you realists that are here today. There is a time and a place to set boundaries and seek justice and perhaps, perhaps even go to court. So don't, don't hear me being overly naive. I know how hard it is to live in a broken, fallen, sinful, and at times evil world. But we need to be very, very careful about using dragon weapons to bring about justice, whether it be personal justice or corporate justice. Lamb weapons are almost always more effective, and they're always more redemptive. Amen? Okay. And this is why we have to talk about weddings and Easter, okay? Weird book, Lamb and Dragon Teams, Weddings and Easter. Here we go. Um, did you know weddings are a lamb weapon? You didn't know that, did you? Okay. Uh, so I, let, me, let me unpack this. I love weddings. I really do. I especially love my wedding. Uh, I got married eight years ago. Super fun. We celebrate our anniversary here in just like a couple weeks. Here, here's a picture of us. We, we came out on the dance floor. Yeah, don't be too impressed with this guy because he can't even do it anymore. He's broken down. But check out my wife, man. Look at the elevation here. She's like, I mean, that's got to be, what, a 30 cents? 36 inch vertical or something like that. But look at the heels. Guys, imagine landing on the heels. That's, I've been impressed all week looking at this picture. Like, wow, she actually did that. Didn't break an ankle. It was a ton, ton of fun. It was, it was the best day of my life was the day of my wedding. I had so much fun. So much fun. Well, you may not know this, but Team Lamb is invited to a wedding feast in the future. Did you know this? Check this out. Revelation 19, 6 through 7. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Let me tell you what's happening here. In John's vision, when Jesus returns, it's going to be like a great big wedding feast. And, and Jesus will be the groom and his church the bride and it will be the greatest day of our lives. There will be dancing and singing and laughing and rejoicing and Michelin five-star food and bottles of wine that, that none of us can afford. And, and then for entertainment, it says later in chapter 19, we'll watch the dragon be destroyed. Yeah. I can't wait. It's going to be the feast of feasts, the party of all parties. So you have to ask the question, why a wedding feast? What's this symbolic of? Why does God end this stage of history and start the next one with a wedding feast? Why not a gala or bingo night or something? You know? Because what happens after a wedding ceremony? Yeah. Don't get too weird, but one of the reasons my wife was jumping so high was the honeymoon, okay? What happens after a wedding ceremony 
there is a union. And we will be restored forever and ever to the oneness we were made for with God and with each other. Is that good news? Whether you know it or not, what your heart longs for more than anything, more than anything, what it aches for is oneness with God and oneness with others. Nothing else can satisfy the deepest parts of our heart. And that's what happens after the wedding ceremony. In Matthew 22, Jesus tells a parable about a king who, who throws a wedding feast for his son. And uh, all these guys go out, these servants go out, and they hand out all the invitations to their family and friends. And uh, no one RSVPs. And the king is like, I got a bunch of lame friends and family members. And he gets really mad. And he tells the servants, okay, just go out now and just invite anybody and everybody who wants to come to, to this wedding, the wedding of my son. And on the day of the wedding, it was a very motley crew. Like they were a pretty messy group of people. But, man, they had a lot of fun. What's the meaning of the parable? Well, God our Father is the king. Jesus is the son. And in this story, we're the servants. And we're to go out and invite everyone, everyone to follow the lamb who was slain and to one day participate in the wedding feast of the lamb. Jesus, our king, says, go, go and invite everybody. Everybody is invited whether they choose to come or not. I was at a wedding a few months ago. Uh, Tim Brown was a staff member. And you remember Tim? He's the really good-looking guy. And uh, people have been grieving. At least half of you have been grieving ever since he left. And he's, he's at uh, Church of the City in New York with John Tyson doing a great job. And uh, his wedding was at Castle Pines. I'm from Kansas, okay? Grew up middle class. I go to Castle Pines. I'm like, I don't think I belong here. Like, am I dressed well enough. I'm like, I go in this tent. It's just, it's really fancy and everyone's eloquent. And it's like, it's the food's amazing. So I, I go through line, the line. I get this prime rib and I go, that was really good. I tell my wife, that was awesome. And I go back again. And I go, no one's noticing. I'll go back again and again. I went back four times and ate prime rib. It was incredible. But I was like, I don't, I don't deserve to be here, but well, I'm here. What the heck? Let's have a good time. I think that's how we're all going to feel at the wedding supper of the Lamb. I don't deserve to be here, but thank God I am. Let's party. And our job between now and then is to invite, to invite our friends to the wedding supper. So Easter, here's where Easter comes in. Wedding supper is Easter. Easter is a lot, a lot like a wedding ceremony, okay? You guys know this. People dress up. There, there's lots of joy. We sing songs and we laugh and we cry and we, we hope. And some people make vows to God that they'll be one with God forever. And it's a, it's a foretaste of the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's why we want everyone to be here next week. And let's not miss the opportunity to invite all of our friends. That's the point of Jesus' parable. Let's invite our friends. Like early uh, this year, Jason, our lead pastor, gave us a theme as a church for the year. The theme of, of one. Okay? We're to seek oneness with God. We're, we're to seek oneness with each other. We're to care for one another and then he said, wouldn't it be cool if all of us reached one person, baptized them, and helped them become a disciple? I, I want to encourage you this week, think about your one. Who's your one? Invite your one. And even if they say no, go invite some other people. Let's, let's, let's invite everyone we can think of, okay? Because next week is a foretaste of the wedding supper of the Lamb. And our king wants everyone to be there. So as you came in, there, there's cards on your seats. You're probably sitting on some of them. Um, the cards have the QR codes. that will tell you everything you need to know. Like Trevor said about Easter, you can use them to invite your friends. Uh, I want to encourage you this week, you know, if you're not following us on social media, please do so. Repost our story. Let's, let's invite everyone, everyone we know, to Easter. This foretaste of the wedding supper of the Lamb. Let's fill this place with people who need to know how much God loves them. Revelation, it's a weird book, but I love it. And, and people have done some really weird things with it. But if we read it cosmically and symbolically, it funds our imagination about the past, the present, and the future. 
and Revelation teaches us that there's a cosmic battle going on all the time around us between good and evil, between Team Lamb and Team Dragon. And it teaches us that the Lamb has already won the ultimate victory for us through His cross and His resurrection. And He promises to finish what He began when He comes back and He resurrects all things. And so for now, we keep winning battles against the dragon using lamb weapons, not dragon weapons. And one of our weapons is inviting people to follow and worship the lamb with us. We have a great opportunity to do this next week. So let's not miss it. Now, some of you futuristic kind of people, you're like, okay, there's a wedding supper. What happens after that? G, uh, C.S. Lewis, in the last battle of the Chronicles of Narnia, frames the nature of our future with God and each other this way. He says, and for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. May you remember this week that you are in a cosmic battle between good and evil. And may you fight your battles against Team Dragon using lamb weapons, not dragon weapons. And may you live with deep hope and anticipate that future day when you will eat at the wedding supper of the lamb. And after that, write a story with God where every chapter, every chapter is better than the one before. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I pray this over you, my church. Amen. We're going to come to the table this morning as a little practice round for the future where we eat together with the lamb and one another.